Sex is not reproduction or species preservation. It is gene selection. This is the idea known as the selfish gene, which was captured in the book The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins. But today, I'm going to go beyond the selfish gene. I will talk about all that is connected to it. Life, death, immortality, selfishness, replicators, sex, and you pick. At the end, I'll talk about the questions that keep you up at night. You know, the ones that grip at your soul. Why am I here? What am I doing here? What is the meaning of life? Is there a meaning to all this? What if there isn't? And all of that in one lecture. Now buckle up and hold on to your seats tightly because this is going to blow your minds. We will start with the story of the unfortunate young American chemist, George Price. How he has devised his equation, how it has led to the concept of selfishness. How selfishness then becomes the selfish gene and selfish genes become us. At the end of this journey, we will find meaning. The sad story of George Price begins in America. Everyone who he loved died around him. He had a wife who was a strong Christian, but George was a strong atheist. And this has led to their separation. After this event, George got very interested in biology, even though originally a physical chemist. Without any formal training in statistics or genetics, he has devised the Price Equation, which is, to this day, the most fundamental and the most accurate description of population genetics and selection at large. He also came up with something called the Evolutionarily Stable Strategy, which is also one of the most important ideas in biology today. He has devised the Price Equation, which predicted selfishness. He didn't want to believe it. And as a result, he started showing random kindness to random people, stating that he had too many coincidences in his life. He converted to Christianity and finally seeing that his idea of selfishness turned out to be true, unable to disprove his own equation, he killed himself by cutting his own carotid artery with a pair of nail scissors. This idea has opened up a whole new branch of science of evolutionary biology that is actually capable of explaining the most basic facts of our lives, such as sex and what happens around it. There has been a large body of research done in the 80s and 90s that's virtually unknown to the public. And today I'm going to talk about the selfish gene itself, the basis for all of this. And also the meaning of life, because these two things are very, very closely intertwined. Now, you don't have to understand his equation or what each term means. But essentially what it means is that it's a mathematical description of selfishness. You can see that there are only two terms in this equation and these terms all contain the letter W which stands for fitness and that means the number of offspring one individual has on average that carries a certain trait. Now, I, I'm not going to go into the exact interpretation of the equation, but 
what you will see is that the equation itself does not contain a term that does not contain W. That means one subject to this equation, which I'm not, on purpose I'm not saying what this subject is, that subject has to, to care only about himself in order to be maximally successful according to the equation. That means it has to be selfish. Now, the biological meaning of selfishness is that you take win-win deals as well as win-lose deals. It's just the same. The only thing you care about is how it affects you. Other people are not a factor, just like other people are mathematically not a factor in that equation. Now look, there's another thing. You must be willing to draw the short end of the stick. That is, if someone else gets a deal that's better than the deal you get, but you still get something out of it, you do, you do whatever it is uh, the equation is about. So selfishness also means uh, be willing to draw the short end of the stick. Now the real question is, do people act this way? However, the answer that George Price gave was that this cannot be. This is not how individuals act. There has to be a problem here. And Price has tried to disprove his equation which has cost his life. But as it turns out, not only is the equation true, but Price was right as well. And that is the result of the fact of selfish genes. That is, genes are selfish, not humans. It's not the individuals, it's not the animal, not the plant. It's the gene that's selfish. And this kind of selfishness is reflected in our behavior. Remember the selfish homeless people. They were selfish just because their genes didn't override the selfish behavior. Selfishness basically is logical, according to Price's equation. But to explain why we're altruistic sometimes and why we do non-selfish things, we need to understand the selfishness of the gene. There has been a very illustrative study done on selfishness when two people had to split money between themselves. They were complete strangers and all they had to do is to split a hundred dollars between each other. Now one had a hundred dollar and he made an offer to the other one and when he made an offer like you keep 40, I keep 60, people took it. They said okay I get 40 dollars for nothing, that's good. But when the offer was uh, you get 20, I get 80. They did not accept the offer. It was derogatory and their selfishness was not triggered anymore. Instead, they started acting spiteful, which is one of the consequences of this uh, selfish gene worldview that we're going to explore. Oh, and I, I forgot to say that if the person didn't take the offer, no one got anything. They didn't get any money at all. Now, to gain more understanding, we have to define the notion of the replicator. Now, I am going to introduce the replicator exactly the same way as Richard Dawkins. Or I should say, Richard Dawkins, the English evolutionary biologist with a hilariously posh accent and a distaste for God. Let me ask you the question. What gets a name? What is it that we name? Well, obviously, it's the things that we see. 
but what is that we see? And there's a twofold answer to the question. First of all, let's let's look at the snake. This is a toy snake. Now, this got a name, toy snake. Well, let's just say snake. So first of all, there are things. A snake is a thing, for example, and it's stable enough that it can exist, that it exists long enough for us to see, so we give it a name. We call it a snake. Now there's another thing that gets a name. Look, the bite. The snake can do something that doesn't last very long, but it happens quite often. So it's an action, but it still gets a name because it happens quite often, at least often enough for us to notice that the snake bites. And that's the second thing. We're gonna call the first thing survival, the ability to survival and to be stable, the ability to survive and to be stable, and the second, the ability to reoccur, and we're gonna call that reproduction. And now I will take out my Dawkins accent. A replicator is any chemical or mixture of chemicals that is capable of reproducing itself identically and exactly. It has two different properties. Two. I should stand in the camera. Two. Survival and reproduction. The survival, that's the easiest one. Does it die or does it not? Does it live and how long does it live? What is the lifetime? That's the most fundamental one. The second one is reproduction. The, more, the longer it lives, the more it can reproduce. Reproduction has a speed and an accuracy. These things together t will tell you how much this r replicator replicates, or in other words, how many of it exists at a certain time. Death is inevitable. There is nothing in this world that has ever lived forever. There is nothing in this world that lives now and is not going to die. And this is true even for replicators. However, they have an ability that we humans don't. They create exact copies of themselves. This means that we cannot tell apart which one died and which one survived. And genes themselves are replicators. They can copy themselves, uh, cells can divide, and you have two times as much genetic material as you started with. However, humans, or any animal to be precise, uh, they are not. They're not replicators. I cannot make an exact copy of myself. It would be fun, but I can't. I can only copy my genes. So this means that there's a new ability here that genes have and I don't. And that is what we're going to call immortality. That is, they can reproduce themselves exactly, so even if the original one dies, it doesn't mean anything, it still exists, it has cloned itself. But humans are not immortal in this sense, of course. You die. And your genes don't. And this will be the key to understanding why genes are selfish and why you are the way you are. Dawkins himself said that his book, The Selfish Gene, should be the immortal gene because immortality is the most profound property of the gene. 
implying death in the cycle of life. I think we can call this immortality. No individual, no human or no plant is equipped with this, but every gene is. Because every time you reproduce, your genes should ideally stay unchanged. Because genes do act selfish all the time. It is because they can reproduce themselves exactly that they become the units of natural selection. Something that natural selection acts on, that is, either genes survive or they don't. That's how nature acts. It's, it doesn't act on phenotype, that is, doesn't act on you, it doesn't act on species, it doesn't act on groups, it acts on genes. Instead of acting on you, it acts through you. It acts through the environment and it acts on the gene. This makes the gene the unit of natural selection. Now, just a moment, because I think to a certain extent it does. It does act on individuals, groups, etc. That's a more modern view that's called multi-level selection. But you still have to admit that the most important uh, selection is acted on the gene. And this is known as the gene-centric view of evolution, which uh, is of course described in the selfish gene. The man to credit here is uh, William Hamilton, the, the English evolutionary biologist who has uh, who has started this uh, this direction and we're going to come back to him because he has a lot to tell us. Now that we understand the the price equation is not about us, it's about our genes. We can get a better understanding of what it is. So first of all, there's the W. The W is fitness. Let's imagine that there's a population of N individuals and there's a second generation of N prime individuals. Then N prime over N would be fitness. That's a ratio. But fitness of what? Of the gene. Fitness of the gene stands for the number of individuals that had the gene. That's the denominator. And the numerator is the number of new individuals that have the gene. So if the gene has increased in numbers, it has a larger than one fitness. If the the gene has decreased in fitness, decreased in numbers, then it has a lower than one fitness. Z is just the name of the particular gene. For example, it could be a gene for blue eyes. It could be a gene for tallness. And now we're going to take the example of being tall. There is no actual gene of being tall. There are many genes that make us taller. But we're going to take one as an example. The left side of the equation is the increase in the number of the individuals that have the certain gene present in it. The right side has two terms. One of them is the covariance term. The cov means covariance. The other one is the E term. E means expectation value or expected value. The covariance term, uh, for, for that we have to understand covariance. That means if something varies like this and something else varies like this, then they co-vary. They are varying the same way. 
if something varies up and something else goes down, it's another function, then they have negative covariance. They have zero if one goes up and the other just stays. That's a, an intuitive description. We're not going to go into the exact maths and statistics. Now, the covariance term means that the more having that certain gene co-varies with having uh, success, having more children, the more that gene is going to spread. So that's left side, right side. That's, that's pretty easy. The second term is a bit more tricky, the expectation value term. Because if the expectation value is different, that it contains a delta uh, z in it, it's different from uh, from I'll just give you an example. Let's say taller people have taller children. That means there's a delta z. There's an increase in the tallness in the 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 effect of the gene. Let's say there's an increase in it then people are going to be taller. So there are two cases, two cases, then people are going to be taller. One is that taller people have taller children. That's the expectation value term. And the other one is taller people have more children of their height. That's the covariance term. So those two things together will give you how tall the population is or, or if it's going to get taller or if it's going to get shorter. So the little trick I made there is I said that the gene and tallness uh, are the same but they aren't actually. So there is no such thing as the tall gene but if there were this is how it would work. It works for genes but genes work in devious ways that are uh, not discussed in this lecture. But if it's really the genes that are so important, then why are there individuals? Why are there groups? Why do we live in the kind of world that we live in? Why don't we have just genes floating around in the sea? Well, to answer the question, uh, first thing you have to do is ask yourself, why do we have houses? And there is nothing simpler than that. Houses save us, they protect us, the elements cannot disturb our lives. Now the same thing will be true for the gene. Because you never see genes alone, you never see just a replicator in the sea. Life is it's kind of particular, it's, it's in cells and one cell contains more genes just like a house contains more people. Now we know why we have houses but you also have to take note of the fact that we build the houses and the same way the genes build the cells. Those genes that can build cells will reproduce in larger numbers, they'll be safe, they will survive. That's why the genes build the cells. The cell is the basic structure of life. You see, there's a little globe of DNA in the middle of every cell and the mechanisms around it are basically protecting that little DNA from all the harm that is outside. And all the living functions make this shell much more efficient, much more protective, much better than our own houses. The gene that can build the better working cell around it will survive. This tactic has also been extended. That means mice hide in holes, we build houses. 
we do the same things, animals do the same things that genes did. The only difference being that it's now an extension of the animal instead of the cell being an extension of the gene. This idea is known as the extended phenotype. These houses, called cells, come together into multicellular individuals, just like houses are built together into cities. It is simply much more efficient to have these things together in one place. It's an economy of scales. And now you get to sex. Why it's gene selection, why it's not reproduction, especially not species preservation. Why do we have sex and why do we crave it so much? Well, older theories explained it in terms of species preservation or the rep reproduction of the individual. But now we know that none of these stand up. Sex is actually only good for the gene. It does not reproduce individuals or groups in any way. Individuals and groups are not replicators. However, a gene is. And that means sex leaves it untouched. And it propagates it through time to the next generation. So the genes kind of hop from body to body. Now, in bacteria, that means that they are clones of each other. One bacterium is very easily disposable. That is, one dies, no problem, we have another one. Just like you can leave your house anytime you want, the genes can leave the cells, although not physically. They leave one cell behind, they clone it, and then the original one can die. They sort of hop from body to body. That means one body is disposable, which is known as the theory of disposable somas. Your soma means everything you are, your functions, but not your genes. Your soma is just built around the gene. Soma is simply Greek for body. But because somas are so easily left behind, we had better think about them not as buildings, but as vehicles. A soma is a vehicle, it's a gene machine that carries the gene from one place to the other and then it's left behind. It, the gene has never intended to keep the soma forever in the first place. The somas are just there for a function. Now for us this is kind of different, as we are not replaceable like they are. An example of disposability is a car. Let's, let's look at my Lamborghini Diablo. It works. Wait. Yeah, it does. The door opens. Pretty cool car, it works, but this one doesn't. After a time, if you open this too much, it doesn't work anymore. So, what good is that? Nothing. You get another car. Pretty similar. Still Lamborghini Diablo. But this is an updated version. Because it can do this. Look. Its wheels are moving. So, this is pretty much what happens to the gene. When it gets into a new body, it recombines its uh, recombines the DNA with DNA from another source, creating something similar, still Lamborghini, but it's a bit better. This is the SV. 
Your child is your updated version. If sex is actually not even good for us, then why do we crave it? Well, for that, the answer lies in the disposable somas. We are built to propagate those genes. Whatever is good for the gene, we're going to do. And we're going to like. How are you going to trick your soma, your body, your vehicle, into doing something you want without you taking the steering wheel? The answer to that is simple. Make them like it. So if a, if a gene creates an individual that likes to propagate the gene, well then, the gene will be propagated. Also, if a sexual disease, for example, raises the desire of the human, such as syphilis, then it will spread the disease. We know of parasites that will make their hosts go crazy so that they'll be eaten and the host, uh, by being consumed by the predator, will transfer the parasite to the predator. It's all about spreading. However, we are still relatively disposable. At least disposable enough that we age and disposable enough that we die and we get diseases and all of that. And instead of trying to live forever, the genes prefer sex and reproduction through that. And this is known as the theory of disposable somas. Well, we are disposable enough that you age and I age and one day we're all gonna die. We're all headed in the same direction. 28,000 days. That's how much you have. That's approximately 77 years, which is the average lifetime of the average person in the Western world today. However, your youth is only about 3,650 days. You sp you spend a third of that asleep and a lot of eating, drinking and a lot of eating, drinking, physiological needs all of that takes away a lot of time and how much remains you barely know and what are you going to do about it? what are you going to do with it? are you going to think? You might even ask yourself, why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do this if we die anyway? Is this not just all so meaningless? Are we really here as vehicles? Is this all? And as it turns out, the, the role of the vehicle is not so bad. Imagine you're a parent. Maybe you don't have to imagine, maybe you are. But let's say that a child asks you, Daddy or Mom, what is the meaning of life? And you don't want to say 42. So what are you going to say? Are you going to say, shut up? Or, <laughs> I don't know. Or, you might ask yourself this, why do we even have to do this in the first place? Why do we have to get born and, and live, grow up and die? What is this? Is there a meaning to all this? Is there an order to all of this? Or am I just floating around? Are there certain things that I should do that I don't know? Well, 
there is a selfish gene answer to it and there's a subjective answer. I'll start with the subjective. And it comes from a person who has lived through hell, the Holocaust. He is called Viktor Frankl. He is a Holocaust survivor, an Austrian psychologist who has written a book based on his experiences. It was called Man's Search for Meaning. Notice that it's not woman's search for meaning, it's a man's search for meaning. Simply because a woman seems to be much more in touch with the genetical goal of life. However, men often get lost and they search for something to do. They seek what it is they should do. But Frankl said no. There's nothing, exactly nothing at the end of this journey. There's no meaning to be found because you have to give meaning to your life and then it has meaning. Otherwise, no, before that it cannot have any meaning. And as beautiful as Frankl's answer might be, we have to see that it's not the full picture. Let's start with a purposeless world, a barren wasteland, devoid of all meaning and empty. Now imagine a sea and the raindrops falling into it. And in that sea, there are molecules, there are replicators. Any mixture of chemical can be a replicator as long as it replicates. And these replicators are purposeless things. They just float around. All they do is exist. That's all they can do. However, certain replicators are just better at existing than other ones. The ones that can build cells that survive in larger numbers are the ones that will be seen all around us. They will be the ones to survive. This gives a direction. There are certain things that work and others that don't. So even in a purposeless world where things just happen by themselves, a direction is given by evolution. In fact, this is known as evolution. The direction of change in a purposeless world because nothing is truly random. But when it comes to you and I, we were built by these genes. And indeed, we are purpose-built machines and our purpose is simply to ensure the success of the genes that made us. However, you have to take note that some of the genes exist better than other genes, that is in larger numbers. The amount of resources has to be limited because we live on planet Earth and the planet has inherently limited resources. That means that there's going to be a competition between these genes. You can't just grow infinitely because someone else is trying to grow as well. And thus you compete. And this way, things start to get a direction. Genes that make vehicles that are better at survival will survive in larger numbers. That means that the, the way these replicators look will uh, be very defined. They will be defined for functions. For example, 
a hand is a very functional tool. It, it looks like it has a purpose. The gene machine that is us is literally a purpose-built machine. And the purpose of the gene machine would be to make the genes reproduce and survive, to host them, shelter them, and give them whatever they want. Now this answer might sound empty compared to the one given by Viktor Frankl, but when properly understood, it not only includes Frankl's answer, it's more than that. Let us envision the most obvious way of making sure your genes exist. That's reproduction. That's sex itself. And then having children and raising them. That's the most obvious way, but it's just one of the ways. What evolution truly selects for is the ability to have the largest number of grand children. That is because you can have a child, but then the child might not succeed, therefore cutting off your lineage. And in animals that do not have social behavior, indeed having the largest number of children is the goal, but for us, no. We give our success, our time, our money, our investment to our children. That means we make sure they are successful as well. And that means that we are actually maximizing our number of grandchildren. So all that time and effort will all be meaningful. And also it goes further down the lineage, but you have immediate control over the grandchildren, so behavior will evolve to support grandchildren. For example, if, some, if someone has a grandson, they are revitalized again. Just look at them. Look at a person who's, who's listless, tired of life and then they have a grandson and suddenly they're full of life, they're pumped up. Daddy, is that the meaning of life then? And also, what if you can't do it? Or what if you just don't want to? What if you think you have better things to do with your life than raising up a few kids? What if you think that you are born for more or maybe you just want to have fun what if you are incapable maybe for accidental reasons maybe not maybe you're born this way what now what then what can you do is your life meaningless and should it end right now no on the contrary the answer here comes from the founder, from the propagator of this selfish gene theory himself, William Donald Hamilton. Hamilton was working in the 60s with something called kin selection, mostly observed in honeybees, for example, when they will sacrifice themselves for each other and they will reduce their own fitness just because they want to increase the fitness of their queen and the queen is the one who lays all the eggs everyone else is infertile how how is that even possible and to that he came up with a mathematical index known as the coefficient of relationship. 
If you go back to your parents, you inherit 23, 23 chromosomes from each of them. That's pretty easy math, 50%. You can consider your degree of relationship as 50% of your father, 50% of your mother. Even though you yourself are not a 50-50% mixture, the number of chromosomes are. And that's what we count. A relationship to a sibling is also 50%, but for a different reason. That's a statistical average. Your sibling, let's say your sister, she's from the same pool as you are, the same 48 chromosomes. However, it's a different mixture. It might be that you two are very similar or very dissimilar, but on average it's going to be 50%. So both siblings and parents will be 50. And the way you calculate is you, you go up to the closest common relative. For example, with a sister, it would be a father or a mother. That's just one step. And that step you divide by two. And if you have shared common ancestors, such as with your sister, you add up the numbers you get. So quite simply, that tells you statistically how much of your genetic material you share with a relative. The amount of genes you share with the average person is about 1 in 128. Kin selection means that your actions will not only serve you but your kin, your kind. There's a mathematical inequality known as Hamilton's rule to exactly display this. What it says is that if a large number of kin, such as three sisters, survive if you die, that is their added together genetic material is more than yours, then you are going to sacrifice yourself. And not only are you going to sacrifice yourself, it's not just sacrifi sacrifice, it's more. It's decreasing your own opportunities for them. In other words, you are going to show altruistic behavior of any kind towards those people in those situations, such as the bees. The bees are all sisters to each other. One dying is just an easily explicable act of altruism. But humans are not all that related, which is why the homeless people used price. Price's kindness and altruism was actually just foolish and Evolution has selected him out. So now you know that there is meaning in caring for others, for our loved ones, for our related ones and loved ones, because that's different. Loved ones are linked to our own reproduction. That is, the ones we have sex with are, even though they're not related, they are just about 128th. They are still responsible for our reproduction. That is love. And I think explaining the origin does not destroy the beauty in any way, shape or form. However, there is a dark side. There is a darker tint to this all. Vengeance and spite. Because if an organism is willing to act good for someone else, they're willing to hurt someone else in order to get advantage, not just for themselves, but for 
their kind. Think of a war. You go to war, you probably die. There's a large chance of death, wounds, and long-term impairment of function of any kind. Yet you go. Because you and your people, if you win, you get to reproduce with all the females of the other tribe, other country, whatever you, you take as an example. Let us now come back to meaning. I have defined it as the purpose I have identified meaning with the purpose of the body and I said that actions which we take to this end will be meaningful. So now we know having children is meaningful. Now we know altruism is meaningful and sometimes even vengeance. However, there are at least two more things you have to know. And that is all connected. That's about helping humanity and helping others. Because you see, you and I, we surely and definitely have one thing in common. 99.9% .9 of our genome. The remaining 0.1 is the only bit that makes you and I different. The rest of it is the same. So 99.9 .9 means that we're actually better off. That implies that showing altruism to humanity increasing the survival of humanity at large is something very, very meaningful. Possibly the most meaningful of all things. Nikola Tesla, possibly the most influential man who has ever lived on this world. The inventor of AC, alternating current, has never had sex. He's never had the chance to have children. He was married to his work. And I think that is a noble marriage. I think that by doing that, he has done much more work for humanity than if he had two, not just for humanity, but for himself, than if he had two children. Tesla himself was more genetically successful by not having children. And this is the last piece. If you don't want to have children, don't have children. Just as simple. There's meaning in basically everything that will help humanity. The video is something of the fourth kind. It is construction. We make something that can later be used by others. It's not for my benefit. It's for a common benefit. But because of the twisted ways that the world works, I myself get something out of it. Something that I will never feel, but I know exists. And this is how to judge success. Because we have come to the point of being able to define biological and even non-biological success. The non-biological, let's go to Frankel, is just whatever you think you should be doing and achieving it. However, the biological one is the biological meaning I just gave you. Success in both cases means how far down the path of meaning can you go. How far have you gone and how much do you have left 
Well, that's not part of success. That's just a question to think about. But there is a link. A link between the objective and the subjective success. Because objective success can be achieved through so many ways besides the children. The Viktor Frankl just told you to how to choose a way. He didn't tell you why. That now I'm telling you that subjective success is just the way to objective success. And now you get it. It can be achieved through so many ways of helping and so many ways of generating value that you have to think which one you choose. And now you actually gave meaning. Meaning that gives biological meaning as well. So Frankel was right. You have to choose. You have to give life meaning. But always keep in mind the meaning you give has to correspond to a purpose that furthers the survival of humanity, of humans, of others, and of the future. Subjective success is merely the way in which objective success is achieved. And if you survive in them, that is when you are successful. That's what makes people successful. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Now you know. Now you know the most basic truth of life. If you have made it this far in the lecture, now you know. Now you know the meaning, why we are here, and what is it we have to do. Now, are you going to do it? Or are you just going to stand? Because now you know the secret. You cannot unthink this idea. Now you have it in your head. And it's never going to leave you alone unless you do what's right, unless you do what your genes tell you you should do. Because if you do not do these, you will disappear as if you have never existed in the first place. You might see this as a whole new set of problems, things you've never seen before, but actually it has been there all the time. You just didn't know and now you know, and now you can do something about it. Moreover, it gives you priorities because you can think of the actions of life as priorities. First, it survives. It eats, drinks, avoids the predators. Then it mates, then it creates, does things that will further not just its survival, but everybody else's survival around it. That's what the organism does. And now you can have priorities. Not the priorities given to you, but priorities of yourself and priorities of truth. And now you got no choice. You already know that you're in this game of life. And this game started when you were born and it's never going to finish until you die. You know you have to succeed. That's what you have to do. That's what you came here to do. Investment, time, money, effort, that does not matter. You have to produce something whether it's children, whether it's your contribution to the world, you pick. 
but you have to produce something just to exist, just to just to satisfy your own purpose, your inherent genetical purpose, biologically defined purpose of propagating your little replicators, your genes. And success is senior and superior to all of these. Success has been the reason why you have evolved to be what you are. From the simplest life form, billions of years of evolution has led to you based on this principle. And now you have to continue. Now you have to propagate. Because it happens anyway. You are in the game of life anyway. Now you have to learn how to play. You have to win. Because if you don't, you die. That's the, that's the beauty and also the scary part of the game. That dying, death, is the only possible end of it. You come from an unbeaten line of ancestors. No one has died before they reproduced. Those genes got into you. It's actually a privilege to be here. Most of us, or most things possible, don't get to exist. You did. In essence, knowing the facts of biology will make you hustle. Now, now what does that mean? First of all, let's define the opposite of hustle. And the opposite of it is comfort. Middle class and upper middle class people are right now living in comfort. They do not feel that there's a certain pressure on them. They'll, they'll wait. They'll think, oh, life's going to turn out well. I'll get my degree, whatever. And they think that life just works out when it doesn't. Not that they're going to die necessarily, but evolutionarily, they may. There's an opposite, an opposite of this, and that's hustle, which is an American term for lower class, usually black people, who are born in a very unfortunate situation and they do everything in their power to get out of it. Everything. Con artists, uh, drug dealers, murderers, thieves, they become anything anything just so they can make it. It's basically get rich or die. Now, biology doesn't care about money, but the mindset is the same. It's make it or die, because you're dying anyway. Waiting is just dying. The replicator does not have an infinite lifetime, and it has to reproduce or produce as much as it can, and it has a given time. You probably have your 28,000 days. Pressure is good. Pressure is evolutionary pressure. Without it, there is no change possible. Let me give you an analogy. An analogy of evolution. It's like a balloon or an airplane. An airplane is better. An airplane in the air. Flying. It can never stop. Once it stops, it's dead. It will fall down. But you have to make this airplane better. Let's say you start with a Zeppelin and your aim is, I don't know, an SR-71 Blackbird. You have to change slowly. You have to improve while in the air. And that's not something that is done quickly. But even after understanding all of this, sometimes we only live for the here and the now. Sometimes we're just 
existing. Sometimes we don't consider the truth and we just want to smoke something to forget. Well, I'm telling you that that behavior would be the equivalent of suicide. Because let's look at suicide itself. Voluntarily ending one's life. All it is is quitting the game because you are in it anyway. We exist anyway. The only way not to play is to quit. And the only way to quit is to die. And the only way to voluntarily die is known as suicide. We fear the end of life for a reason. And we all do. And we do it to preserve ourselves. It would be foolish not to fear it. But some of us, despite this fear, have decided to finish it. Why is that? How could this type of behavior have evolved? And the evolution of it simply lies in the fact that that you dying is not necessarily bad for your genes. It is indeed a form of self-sacrifice for the good of the genes of others. But it's triggered differently. It's triggered when a person feels that their life is meaningless. Now I'm telling you it isn't. What I'm actually telling you is that now because you know what meaning is and you have it anyway, if not a self-given meaning, then you have the biological meaning. And that means whatever you do, you should keep going on and make the most of it. Maybe it's just very little success. Maybe all you get to do in this life is to bring one child into this world. Good. Still do it. You still have to do it. Still, it is your task. Every living person on this planet has unfinished business. And you know already when it's going to be finished. Price has died of suicide. What an unlikely end for a person who has devised the equation which says do not kill yourself and do not be kind to strangers has actually been very kind to strangers which led to his death. Probably the most ironic deaths, at least one of them in history. The biography of George Price is called The Price of Altruism. And I suggest reading bits of it. But if there is one thing you take from me, is that you must read the selfish gene. Because even though I went beyond the gene in this lecture, I went beyond what's in the book. The book has a lot of other concepts, evolutionarily stable strategies. One of Price's own uh, inventions or uh, memes, one of my favorite concepts. All of these are in the selfish gene. I myself will lecture about these. However, in the meantime, read the book. So let us do a quick recap. We started with George Price, who made up the equation that said selfishness is the best thing you can do but it turns out it's not about you it's about the gene it also turns out that genes are replicators while we humans are not that means that the gene will become the unit of natural selection and it also means that you and I are merely vehicles to these genes. 
we are not so important. However, we are important in the sense that we have a purpose that genes do not. Genes gave us a purpose. They gave us meaning. Thus, our lives are meaningful. All right, got it? Cool. And also, genes can dispose of you, they will dispose of you, and no matter what you do, this is the case. You are going to die, period. So you had better start working on yourself and your purpose. If you don't have one, go get one. Easy to say, hard to do. Still have to do it. <laughs> and just now, looking out of my window, I see a fat woman in a bra leaning out. So I think this is pretty much the best time to end the lecture. Thank you for watching and continue your evolution.